Welcome, welcome to Change Now. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Good. All We're good? Yeah. All good? Nice. Brilliant. Well, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to just do a little introduction to give you a, a scene as to what each of these um, individuals can bring to the conversation, then we're going to dive straight into some, uh, some conversations. So, Nithya, if we start with you, you believe in universal access to affordable and sustainable energy. You have worked your whole career in emerging markets, designing socially driven technology, and you're now leading the engineering and product development of a new type of distributed off-grid energy infrastructure called mesh grids. Currently energizing over 17,000 people in Nigeria, Haiti, Cambodia, and the Philippines. And you're going to uh, discuss with us today the promising future of off-grid electrification and the challenges that still lie ahead. So please welcome Nithya. Um, Nicola is uh, very much of the belief that true energy transition has not actually started. Why? Uh, because we're still waiting on a new generation of renewable energies. He has deployed, financed, and grown um, technology startups in various industries over 25 years. He is now the CEO and co-founder of Switch Energy, a French deep tech, uh, applying recent breakthroughs to harness what's known as osmo osmotic energy to produce clean electricity at a very large scale. So with the first osmotic power plant going live this year, Nicola is going to discuss with us today why osmotic or blue energy is promising for meeting global electricity needs in a way that blends high science with low engineering solutions. So please welcome Nicola. And Gilles, last but not least, it's so lovely to meet you. Our next um, really believes that a fair transition into a more digitized and electrified world, we must emphasize the human and social aspect of sustainability. Building on your work in NGOs and governments, Gilles has been a driving force um, at Schneider Electric on sustainability since 1998. And you very much shaped the company's sustainability effort um, and founded the Schneider Electric Foundation and led many initiatives around energy access. So you're here to help us understand how we integrate that social um, as well as technology innovation into the energy. Uh, so please welcome Gilles. So it's only fair in a panel that talks about the clean energy revolution to ask our guests, do you actually feel we are in a clean energy revolution. So Nithya, if I come to you first, are we actually experiencing an energy revolution at the moment? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I think we'll have some ver varieties of answers here and um, maybe I can give a little bit more of the positive side <laughs> um, <laughs> because I do come from the lens of maybe specifically in areas of the world where there's no electricity to begin with and I see I think a lot of people really bought in in the opportunity of leapfrogging kind of old traditional forms of energy and going straight to decentralized renewables um, that can actually affordably deliver electricity to all the parts of the world that we haven't been able to with our traditional energy infrastructure so far. So, you know, from the technology, you know, myself and, you know, people in the space who are working hard to come up with ways to deliver renewables in kind of new and innovative ways um, to investment and regulation, um, people more and more thinking about different ways of getting energy to you know, rural and hard to reach parts of the world. I mean, no one's discussing, thankfully, um, like coal-fired power plants in, you know, off-grid Nigeria. So, um, you know, I think there is a buy-in that these renewables play a really large role in the transition of more people getting access to electricity. But I think if we speak to the actual transition of maybe developed countries moving into green or clean energy, that's maybe where uh, the, <laughs> the nuance in whether we are in fact in a transition can come in and, and maybe- you Over to you, Nicola. <laughs> no, but what I think is that uh, it's a very complex uh, transition, um, which never happened in history, right? Uh, it never happened that we shift from one energy to another. We had, we're adding sources of energy, we are not shifting. We've never done that before, which is extremely complex, plus we are electrifying a lot. 
So uh, there is a lot of changes coming, and uh, as the, you, you, the previous speaker pointed out, you know, um, there are also some uh, uh, other o o o geopolitical things at play, etc. Now, this being said, what we see today is that uh, uh, the current trend is that uh, we are adding renewables, we are accelerating, but we are not in a position where we can expect that in 20, 30 years from now, we'll have reduced fossil fuel usages. It's not happening at this stage, which is why, and I think that sobriety is definitely one of the objectives, but the reality is that we will continue, we will need energy, right? And which is why uh, my take is that we need new sources of renewable energy to allow, to accelerate and to make this shift. And uh, I, I can explain you um, uh, what we're doing at Switch Energy. We are harnessing uh, an energy that is called osmotic energy or blue energy, which is the energy, the mixing ener energy when fresh water and seawater meet. So in all deltas and estuaries of the world, you have those two streams of water that meet, and when they meet, they mix, and when you look in detail at a very, very small scale, actually, you have the salt ion moving, and salt ions, and sorry, moving ions is energy, right? And this energy is massive, uh, on Earth, it is, uh, we, we've calculated that there are about 30,000 terawatt hour of osmotic energy that is naturally liber liberated every year, which is more than electricity demand on Earth, right? So we're not going to transform all that into electricity, but we can probably use a good, ch good chunk of that, and the forecast shows that we could provide or supply 15 to 20% of global electricity needs uh, with osmotic energy. And again, so it is not a single answer to the issue, but we need this new type of energies to complement what already exists. Yeah, and I think that idea around we've only ever added as opposed to transitioned or shifted away is a really good point. Julie, if I can bring you in here now as well, from your perspective, are we going through a clean energy revolution? Uh, of course, but uh, the game is very complex. We are in a very interesting time where we have the solutions. We understand better the stakes. We see exactly what's happened if we do nothing. And in the same time, we are not in a, an acceleration at the right level. Uh, many aspects for that, but the revolution is here. I can say we are not in the revolution of the clean energy. Revolutions about this topic. And many aspects in this revolution. I, I, I can mention one on one other. It's certainly during the last two or three years, um, the time to speak in the same time about the offer and about the demand. When we were speaking about energy in the past, all the wound table were only about which type of energy how do we produce energy uh, locally or far uh, with a large plant or a mini grids or a, a solar home system and so on. All these topics are key and electrification is certainly the main asset to go to, uh, to this topic. But because when we are speaking about clean energy, we are speaking about electricity. Mm. Not not only electricity, but the key element of the, of the revolution for clean energy, we consider that it's with electricity. If each of us, we draft the life and the city for 2050, I'm sure that will be only with electricity. When we are speaking about the building, transportation, production and so on, food, when we have to drive the life in 20 and 30 years, we will drive a world only with electricity because we know that uh, we, we could have some other uh, biogas and so on, but in general, the big transition, the shift for this topic is electricity. electricity. Why? It's because it's better to produce electricity and to reduce uh, carbon emission, but in the same time, it's the best energy to be efficient, to measure exactly what we have to consume, how we can manage that. And we are in a revolution where demand, the demand side, play 
a very big wall for two reasons. First, because the most clean energy is the energy that we, we don't consume. <laughs> and, and for that, we have to change the manner to consume. It's a question of demand side. And from last year, and uh, you mentioned uh, Ukraine uh, uh, war and so on, we are able, and it was not the case previously in Europe, to speak in the same time about efficiency and sufficiency. Efficiency is key. And we have today the solutions for it to be more efficient at home, in the office building, in the plant for the grid, to manage at the same time all the energy. The solutions are here. We have to implement that. But in the same time, when we are speaking about sufficiency, it's to express that we have to use this solution to be more sufficient. sufficient. And to live differently is not possible to consider that us in Europe, we can continue or in other places to live in the same manner in the future if we would like to embark in the development all the people and to be in a world where uh, we can live uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in a good reality. Mm. Then, first revolution, and I will stop just after, it's a question of when we have to speak about clean energy, we, need, we have to speak about electricity, and in electricity, new manner to produce. We don't need to have only uh, big watermelon of production far from the city. We can have a lot of blueberries close to each <laughs> household to produce locally, and it's a part of your job. But it's true in Africa, that could be true in Europe, that could be true in France. Well, and that it's a part of us, the answer. That takes us straight over to you, Nithya, in terms of tell us about this solar mesh grid and these blueberries that you're <laughs> able to, uh, to help Africa in a decentralized model. What does that look like? And is it really scalable? Well, firstly, this is the first time I'm referring to our projects as blueberries, so um, <laughs> that's a whole new framework. Um, maybe I can start by just explaining the problem at hand before I, I mention our solution. So um, we're talking about you know, electricity and making sure everyone has access. So there are still 700 million people in the world who don't have access to electricity, and they're using dirty fuels um, diesel, uh, kerosene, burning wood, all of this. So it all, you know, getting electricity to them plays a role in, you know, cutting out dependence on these fuels. But then the second aspect of this problem is actually delivering electricity to them in a way that is sustainable and financially viable for the companies trying to do that. So for energy utilities in emerging markets who are trying very hard to deliver electricity to these hard to reach parts of the world, they're only getting you know, 40 to $50 per year per household that they electrify. So if your CapEx is you know, over $1,000 up front, you have you know, an, a certain amount of operating expenses per house every year, you're looking at you know, 30 to 40 years to pay back that investment, which means that it hasn't been scalable to the last part of your question there. Um, you know, mini grids have had a lot of promise, but they haven't just taken off and solved this problem because it's really only under very specific situations that they are financially viable. And then in other situations, they either you know, end up kind of falling to waste because they're not financially viable or we just can't deploy projects fast enough. So what we're doing at Okra and this kind of new concept of energy infrastructure that we've imagined is a mesh grid, which is a hybrid of the two kind of real existing types of in, uh, energy infrastructure that's been leveraged. So solar home systems and mini grids. And we come in between here so we get the benefits of cheap and cheaper and flexible systems like solar home systems, but they're interconnected into a modular flexible grid that's more reliable and kind of, yeah, more affordable to deploy in communities that might be, you know, in some of the hardest to reach parts of the world. So, yeah, we see this mesh grid as kind of filling that gap um, and maybe to kind of use the same framework of it's not really about replacing solutions, it's about adding solutions where there are gaps. And so we see mesh grids coming in to meet this like, you know, 80% of this off-grid market that just hasn't been able to be served by mini grids. Um, and yeah, and provide a more affordable and, and scalable solution. So we do think it's really scalable. We've built kind of scalability into the core of the technology, but also into the model and how we work with local utilities, 
um, to actually do that scale up so it's not you know, us trying to go out to off-grid communities all around Nigeria, other parts of Africa, Haiti, but leveraging the kind of um, entrepreneurial spirit, the real dedication of local companies and you know, international companies who are, have a mandate to get electricity to, to off-grid communities um, and letting them do that real scale up, but leveraging our technology. So yeah, I think in short, it's a really exciting time to see this technology being adopted, to see people you know, excited to try a new technology and be like, okay, we've been trying to get electricity, let's try something new and, and see if we can do it and finally find an affordable and kind of financially viable model um, and then scale it up from there. And one of your mesh grids is actually on display at the Schneider Electric stand. So you can go and see the Schneider Electric stand later on and go and ask Nithya about uh, more of that. But Nicola, if we finish, um, now we've talked about the distribution, but you're presenting to us an entire new form or category of um, clean and renewable energy. You've told us a little bit about the scale and the potential, and you have got a pilot that's about to go live. What does an osmotic energy plant look like? What does it feel like? And is this really something that we can run with, or is it a distraction from the other work that we have of electrifying our world? Well, it's certainly not a distraction. Um, um, and as you pointed out, uh, the, the issue is twofold, demand and offer. And I think that uh, at, at the starting point is that uh, we need to produce clean electricity, right? So I think that uh, it's certainly not a distraction. The question, uh, what is needed now are power plants that are both decentralized, which or at least can have different type of size, okay? Because we also need to provide massive quantities of electricity and that are flexible. Uh, flexible meaning they can produce 24 hours a day or uh, provide uh, picking needs, etc. Um, so an osmotic power plant, basically, by definition, is uh, by uh, the river delta, right, or estuary, where you have access to both fresh water and seawater. What you do is that you take a part of the water of the river, you will deviate it to the system, and an osmotic generator is like an electrolyzer in a sense. You know, it's a box with a, this is a membrane technology, right? And so um, you will have fresh water and seawater flowing slowly in the system. It's actually quite boring when you see an osmotic generator. You know, there is no noise, there is no smoke, there is no rotating machine whatsoever. So it's a bit like, what's going on? It's but actually, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's pure magic because it is generating electricity. So the two flows of water slowly mix, and then all water goes back to the river delta, so the, there is no water extraction. And at Switch Energy, we are applying uh, recent discoveries in the uh, nano fluid uh, uh, field and the biomaterial field to develop this system. And one of our objectives was also to develop a system that is also based on biomaterials. We think that to, uh, to, to, to harness the clean energy, better to have a clean uh, technology. Um, this is very modular. Uh, you can do very small uh, plant, uh, very large ones. Uh, there is no high tower. It's, it, it is very uh, efficient in terms of, uh, of uh, a surface that you need. So it's a c and it, provide it can provide electricity 24 hours a day, right? So it's kind of a... Uh, it's, it's a kind of, of a grail of renewable energy in a sense. It's been like 70 years that uh, academics, uh, utilities have been trying to find the technology uh, to, to, uh, to harness this energy. And uh, the game changer, I mean, we, we managed to break the ceiling thanks to uh, 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 recent academic discovery, French ones actually, that we are applying. Now the question is, how do you translate um, deep tech high science into a real solution, industrial solutions, in a sense that it has to be easy to maintain, easy to deploy, and low cost. Because even though uh, money uh, is not a physical thing, right? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is part of the game. If we want to introduce that technology, if we want it to be adopted, and I think you're facing the thing, it, we need it to be economically viable, right? That you cannot just say that's mm -hmm. not the point, right? I fully agree that this is not the only uh, 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 thing that matter, and definitely probably not the first one, 
but that's part of the game, right? If we want to deploy fast. So at Switch Energy, our, uh, our game is to blend high science with low engineering, low meaning, easy to build. Uh, you know, um, I, I like tech, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes Elon Musk says, why think? And he said that the challenge lies in building the machine that makes the machine. And I think it is very important. Technology is not science for science or tech for tech. It has to be for real life, for the community, for the real society at large. And this is what we do at Switch Energy. It's uh, not an easy journey, right? Because uh, science and new science and new innovation is sometimes difficult. But this is really the purpose of the company. And this is really the type of thing that I think can have a true impact. Again, I think sobriety is critical. But I think technology, wise technology, uh, can really uh, participate to this transition. And again, osmotic energy could supply 20% of electric electricity needs in 20, 30 years from now. This is what will allow a true transition, as I said before, right? Because or if or you have... Transformation as well. A true transformation, <laughs> you're right. Gilles, um, neither Nithya or Nicola have chosen easy, easy jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and they okay. are they are they are mar they are navigating a landscape of apathy barriers regulation and of course Schneider you have been investing very heavily both in the innovation and the social side of the energy transformation what have been and we don't have too long left but what have been you know what has been some of the biggest wins or one biggest win and what do you see is the thing that these entrepreneurs need most as we go into the okay two parts in my in my answer uh, in 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 the first uh, discussion we all agree that uh, electricity is the key element of uh, of uh, the clean energy revolution and that we we have to shift all the things that we can shift uh, to electricity in order to reduce carbon emission and to manage better uh, one side uh, the offer and another side the demand. But the, the first question after, uh, after your, your question is what is circular economy when we are speaking about energy? What is economy of the functionality when we are speaking about energy? We use these two words for many different sectors and we know that if we would like to uh, tackle the topic of climate and biodiversity, circular economy is key, and economy of the functionality is key too. How do we use these two words when we are speaking about energy, electricity? Uh, because in general, we don't organize a bridge between these two topics. We have the topic of uh, energy, as on topic about circular economy. Absolutely. How you and me could we use the concept of circular economy when we use the concept of uh, uh, when we are speaking about energy? And for me, digitization is the key element for that. It's because it's not only to speak about one side offer, second side a demand. It's to organize the dialogue between offer and demand every time. We were in a time where we had a lot of volume of energy and we can use energy when we want. We continue to be in this time. Tomorrow, we need to be together and each of us more sufficient. We need to learn to consume when the energy is less carboned. And for that, it's a question of dialogue. And we have the ability now to have solution to organize this smart dialogue between offer and demand to continue and to accelerate uh, the way of decarbonization. Never that will be a mainstream. Never that will be uh, a walk. It's only a race. In two weeks, that will be the Schneider Electric Marathon Paris. It's a marathon without finish line. <laughs> so a finish Never line. we have to be happy in the position where we are the revolution in to continue to accelerate. But to accelerate, we need to embark everybody in two different levels. All, the, consume, all the, the people who consume the energy to be smarter, 
to understand very well how simple jest and sometimes new investment, new manner to consume, new manner to think the future, to have together a better future. We need to share that with everybody. It's not because we have the solution that we don't need to embark the people to be smart with the solution, first topic. Second topic, it's not possible to continue to consider that a part of the population don't need energy, don't need electricity. It's a bad news uh, uh, for biodiversity in these countries. It's a bad news for development. We are all on the same boat. It's not possible to consider this big gap between all the people and the solution like OCRA. It's why in Schneider Electric we have the impact funds in order to be linked to such type of company to learn together. We have some uh, strengths that you, need, that, that you need. You have a lot, a lot of new innovation, new manner to consume, new manner to think the sea. What is very beautiful in Okra? It's a question of technology, but it's a question of community too. It's a question how the people together think about energy, share energy, find the best way to use in a more efficient manner the energy that we have. And we'll leave it there. They, they are able to do that in the village in, in Africa. It's our job here to do that in our quarter tomorrow. Thank you so much. Well, I do hope that this has been a really hopeful conversation because it's not nothing like hearing new solutions and what we actually need to focus on in the second half of this decade and beyond for our forever never-ending marathon. So can I please ask you to thank our panelists um, for your time. And then thank you. Thank you.